Hello, welcome to this lecture. A lecture on implicit memory storage. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, finally all those videos on the uh, basics of uh, biosignaling are done. And as I promised, here's a lecture on the implicit memory storage. Well, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the very first video, uh, the whole focus of all of these lectures are is on the cellular and molecular aspects of, of uh, implicit and explicit memories. So here it is. Uh, this is a lecture on implicit memory storage. Particular, I'm going to talk about just on the uh, about the cellular and molecular aspects of implicit memory. <coughs> so let's begin. I'm sorry. Okay, so <clears throat> I've divided this uh, lecture into two sections. The section one, you know, I'm going to talk, uh, talk this is, which is this uh, video, I'm going to talk about habituation and sensitization. I'm going to define them and uh, explain what happens in these two phenomena. And uh, in the second section of this lecture, I'm going to talk about those uh, structural changes which happen as a result of sensitization. I'm going to, all, uh, I'm going to talk about those uh, mechanisms which are involved and required for the maintenance of the LT LTF or long term facilitation. Again, something that happens in sensitization. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, classical conditioning. Uh, not too much, just, just, just going to explain it. Uh, briefly. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, fine. So uh, we had this uh, chart uh, in the very first video. Uh, these are two forms of long term memory. We, uh, you know, I explained that there are two uh, general forms of long term memory implicit memory or non declarative ones and explicit ones. There are uh, several differences between them. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I think the most important difference between implicit memories and explicit ones is related to the process by which they are recalled. I implicit memories are recalled uh, basically unconsciously actually. But explicit memories are recalled consciously by conscious processes. And there are several subtypes and in this, uh, this lecture I'm going to talk about only the classical conditioning and uh, two forms of non-associative learning, uh, habituation and sensitization. Okay, so let's talk about habituation. Well, I, I, I think uh, <clears throat> a very good way to, uh, to define habituation is to explain how it is induced in an organism. Well, imagine we have an organism. That organism should not necessarily be a very complicated organisms such as a mammal or uh, uh, a vertebrate, okay, it, uh, since habituation is actually the, uh, the most, uh, the simplest uh, form of implicit memory, uh, it is also observed in very simple animals or organisms uh, such as invertebrates, okay, so just imagine we have an organism, so it should not necessarily be a complicated one, and we stimulate that organism uh, <clears throat> we, get, we give that organism a very gentle, mild stimulus. So what happens? Well, the very first time we do that, the very first time we stimulate the organism with a very mild, gentle stimuli, stimulus, the organism, of course, has no idea about the, uh, the nature of, the, uh, of that stimulus. So it's going to uh, respond somewhat vigorously and intensely to that stimulus for the very first time because the organism doesn't know if that stimulus is harmful or harmless <coughs> and of course at the end of this video I'm going to explain the cellular mechanism um, underlying this uh, intense um, reflex for the very first time but as we repeat the same stimulus same mild gentle stimulus the organism actually literally learns something about the, uh, the stimulus and the organism, the response 
uh, the, the intensity of the organism's responses actually decrease. Okay, uh, so the intensity of the organism's responses decreases as we repeat that same stimulus. Okay, and in that case, we say that the animal uh, somehow uh, gets used to that or uh, that stimulus, and we say that the animal or the organism is habituated. Okay, so this is the meaning or the explanation of habituation. <coughs> it's the simplest form of memory, of course. Implicit memory, and uh, well, the very first investigations on habituation were probably done by Sir Charles Scott Sherrington. Well, Scott Sherrington, Dr. Uh, Sherrington was a physiologist, and <clears throat> thus he he uh, his investigations were at the physiological level. He basically observed in his uh, investigations that the, <clears throat> the intensity of certain motor reflexes uh, in the cat actually decreases as a result of repeated stimulation. It's just, uh, uh, just as, as, as I explained. So the intensity of certain motor reflexes in the cat uh, <clears throat> decreases as a result of uh, repeated stimulation. Okay? And <clears throat> Repeated stimulation of, of certain motor pathways in the cat's spinal cord, of course. And, uh, well, he was the very first person who called this phenomenon habituation, or used the term habituation for this phenomenon. And he was a pretty smart scientist because even at that time, he proposed that maybe this phenomenon of habituation has something to do with the <coughs> effectiveness of synaptic connections. It turned out to be true, but at that time, um, no one knew. So, uh, so Charles Scott Sherrington did these investigations at the physiological level. Some years later, Spencer, Thompson, and Nelson, <coughs> I'm not sure if I'm correctly pronouncing the, the, the last name, Nelson, Nielsen, I don't know. Um, so, excuse me for that. They did experiments at the cellular level. They found that, that uh, in, the, in the cat's spinal cord, there are some excitatory motor neurons, uh, sorry, excitatory interneurons that make synaptic connections on motor neurons. And they found that as a result of that um, repeated stimulation, okay, that is very common in inducing habituation, of course, the intensity or the strength of the input from those excitatory interneurons on motor neurons decreases. And that was the very first cellular, cellular evidence of, uh, of the phenomenon habituation. But of course, at that time, there were certain challenges that prevented those scientists to further investigate the habituation at the cellular or even molecular level. And one of those challenges was, of course, the very intricate and sophisticated neuronal circuitry of mammals and vertebrates. <coughs> so, so let me, let me. So what happened next? We all know who this great man is, Professor Eric Kendall. <coughs> Actually, one of the professors um, that I'm sending these videos to is Dr. Kendall. So, Dr. Kendall, if you're watching this video, hello, very glad that you're here, and I'm really honored. Okay, Dr. Kendall, so, um, <clears throat> meanwhile, or maybe a little bit later than Al, um, Spencer, Dr. Kendall and his colleagues and his friends were also working on habituation or, or memory, basically. They were first working on you know, uh, memory in, in the hippocampus, a very uh, complicated structure in mammals. But Dr. Kander realized that, uh, realized that the same challenge, uh, that, that, that the uh, neuronal circuitry is too compli complicated, too complex to figure out how the memory works. So Dr. Kendall at that time decided to take an extremely reductionistic approach to address the problem of habituation or, or memory in general. Uh, 
Dr. Kendall decided to, you know, he said, what if instead of using, you know, a very complicated um, experimental animal, what if we use an invertebrate to investigate memory? Well, that was a reductionistic view. And in, his, in one of his interviews with the Society for Neuroscience, uh, Dr. Kendall said that at that time he didn't know a lot about, uh, you know, the neurobiology of other animals or invertebrates. So he had to research. And uh, what he found, well, he found this guy. This is aplysia uh, or sea slug. And what you see here is just a, a colored toxic, uh, toxic ink, I guess, uh, that the aplysia secretes as a, as a defensive mechanism or act. Anyway, this, this, is, this is aplysia. And so Dr. Kendall decided to work on aplysia uh, and investigate habituation and sensitization and basically simple forms of memory in this invertebrate. Before I explain why Dr. Kendall decided to work on aplysia, let's talk about uh, a little bit about the aplysia itself and its structure and its anatomy. This is the lateral view of this animal. I'm not going to explain, of course, all of these structures. It's an invertebrate, relatively simple uh, organism, but anyway, this blue box here represents the, the head region. This red box uh, shows us the torso, and this yellow box um, uh, outlines the tail. This is a very beautiful illustration. Uh, this is the view from, from, from the top. You can see a lot of ganglions here. Um, I put black boxes around three of, the, three of those uh, structures in the aplysia, which are very important for us. Basically, uh, it turned out that, you know, uh, scientists found that uh, there is a relatively simple marker circuit between uh, the gill and the siphon and the siphon and the tail. And scientists found that in, these, in, in this neuronal circuit, you can find habituation and sensitization. Uh, it means that this neuronal circuit can get heavy treated and sensitized. Uh, so one of those structures is the gill under this mantle shelf. The gill is basically the respiratory organ of the, of the aplysia. Uh, then we have the siphon above the gill. Well, the siphon is a small fleshy spout for expelling the seawater and, and, and the waste. And finally, we have the tail, of course. So these three structures are really important. For, for studying habituation and sensitization in aplysia. Well, this is a picture that uh, uh, it's very funny, and Dr. Kendall loves it. I love it too, because it's somehow accurate. Accurate, you know. Uh, you know, aplysia really contributed a lot to our current understanding of sensitization and habituation. But anyway, so. Uh, there are three important features, three important things about aplysia that made it a very good candidate uh, for the research on habituation and sensitization. One of those features of aplysia is the, is, is, is the number of its neurons. It has only uh, 20,000, around 20,000 neurons, central neurons. And, you know, you can compare it to 86 billion neurons in the human brain. Not even human brain, okay? Let's compare it to the brain of a mouse. The mouse, uh, I guess it's, it has, uh, the mouse brain, it has um, 70 million neurons. So 20,000 is not too much. And it's a lot easier to work with less number of neurons, particularly if you are doing microcircuitous studies. Um, but it's not the only feature. The next feature is the size of its neurons. Aplysia's neurons are gigantic. You know, they're really huge. You can sometimes observe them with, with, without a microscope with an unequipped eye. And those giant neurons uh, make it easier, a lot easier to work with them, to find them, to loca locate them in a specific ganglion, for example and uh, to record uh, 
their electrophysiological properties and so many other things. So it's a great advantage. Okay, and uh, so Plage's neurons are really huge and gigantic. It's another important feature. And there's something about its neural, neuronal circuitry as well. Its microcircuits, I mean the connectivity between its neurons, uh, its neural circuitry is, 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 uh, is much more simple than those neural circuits we see in, in mammals or vertebrates, of course. I mean, even a canonical microcircuit of a mammalian neocortex, neocortex is, is, is much uh, more complicated than, it, than the neural circuitry in, in a plagia. Okay, so uh, not only it has fewer neurons, very gigantic, extremely huge neurons, but its neural circuitry is easy to understand and dissect, relatively easier, okay? So all of these features, uh, made the plagia a very good experimental subject. So, what do we have here? This is uh, uh, a, a top view of the abdominal ganglion. You can see these uh, round things, round objects. These are neurons. They're huge, as I told you. So these are neurons and those on the left, they're called L, and each one of them is assigned a number, of course, and same for those on the right. And, you know, these brown um, large neurons are motor neurons, and they make connections uh, with the gill. And these uh, uh, blue ones, which are relatively smaller, are sensory neurons that innervate the, uh, the skin of the siphon. Okay, and uh, you can see that the, you know, uh, the size of neurons and uh, their relatively simple microcircuitry here. This is the circuitry between the tail and the siphon and the siphon and the uh, gill. Well, we have uh, 24 sensory neurons innervating, as I told you, the skin of the siphon. And they make synapt uh, synaptic connections on motor neurons, six motor neurons, that in turn uh, innovate the gill. And between the tail and the siphon, and of course the motor neuron, we have uh, some interneurons and modulatory in uh, interneurons. We have basically three types of modulatory interneurons. Those uh, are, uh, you know, one of them is serotonergic ones, okay, 5-hydroxytryptamine an R name for serotonin. Um, these are very important for us. Um, in, in other videos, in other uh, sections, we are actually going to talk a, a lot about these serotonergic interneurons. But there are other types of interneurons, basically uh, those interneurons that uh, release a small cardioactive peptide, or SCP, and those L29 interneurons. These are modulatory interneurons, and we have also inter, uh, interneurons, excitatory and inhibitory interneurons as well. Um, for, for habituation, we're gonna focus on this part. Uh, you know, since habituation hap is, is, is uh, homosynaptic, you know, it doesn't require a modulatory interneuron, okay? Uh, so it happens in this circuit, okay? So we're gonna just consider this circuit. And this excitatory interneuron also plays a role in heavy tration. Anyway, so um, as I told you, the neuronal circuitry of aplasia is really simple, relatively simpler than other organisms. And you can see that this is, uh, this is uh, again, the neural circuitry between the siphon and the gill. You can see those sensory neurons that innovate the skin of the siphon, and they make connections with interneurons and motor neurons, and those motor neurons uh, innovate this, the gill. And this is the uh, micro, uh, micro circuit or neural circuitry uh, between the tail and the siphon, and you can see, again, uh, you know, the same type of neurons, uh, uh, sensory neurons, inner neurons, and motor neurons. You know, I'm not going to explain all of them. The, the, the whole point 
is that the neural, the neural circuitry of applied sugar is, is, is relatively much simpler than in other organisms. And so, yeah, that's it. Okay. Before I talk about habituation in aplasia, I need to mention other invertebrates that can be used in, in, uh, in the research on learning and memory, particularly habituation and synthesization. There are, you know, a lot of uh, different types of snails, different types of sea slugs, even honeybee can, can be used. My favorite one is Cynorhabditis, uh, no, Cynorhabditis, yeah, Cynorhabditis, sorry, I learned that today. Um, <clears throat> my whole life I just called it uh, C. elegans. Uh, so it's uh, Cynorhabditis elegans, or C. elegans for short. So this, this, this is a worm here, you can see that. My favorite one is this one because, you know, this worm is, <clears throat> uh, again, has some certain features that, um, that makes it, uh, certain features that make it uh, a very good experimental uh, subject for memory. <clears throat> First of all, it has very few number of neurons. You know, it has uh, around 300 neurons. And another feature which is very important is that its whole genome is sequenced. So its whole genome is sequenced, and that uh, can that uh, enables us to do molecular and genetic manipulations. Like, for example, if you if you if you don't want, if you want to. Uh, figure out the role of one specific protein in, in, the, in, uh, in the induction or expression of long-term potentiation or other types of memory. You can, do, you can for example, uh, <coughs> do molecular and genetic manipulations to understand and to investigate the role of a specific protein in a specific mechanism. Other organisms <coughs> can be used. Each one of them has uh, <clears throat> certain features that make these um, invertebrates um, a very good experimental um, subject for different types of memory. Some of them are good in, in the research on habituation, some of them are good for researching and investigating uh, classical conditioning, some of them can uh, <coughs> uh, show different types of memory. So yeah, I just wanted to mention that aplasia is not the only invertebrate uh, that we can use in the research on um, basically implicit memories. Anyway, let's talk about short-term habituation in aplasia and, and uh, I'm gonna talk about how it is induced Excuse me. So this is our experimental setup. Uh, what we do is that we remove this mantle shelf and under that we have that respiratory organ or the gill and we have the siphon. What we do is that we stimulate the siphon or the skin of the siphon where the, those sensory neurons innovate <clears throat> by a tactile stimulus. A tactile stimulus is just a very mild, gentle stimulus. And let's see what happens. In a control animal or organism, uh, it means that in an organism which is not habituated, <clears throat> when we do that, well, what happens is that we stimulate the sensory neurons which innovate the skin of the siphon. So those sensory neurons are going to release synaptic vesicles on interneurons and modern neurons, okay? And there are some excitatory interneurons uh, that are <clears throat> uh, activated as a result of the activation of these uh, sensory neurons. And so these sensory neurons, as well as these excitatory interneurons, they make synaptic connections on these modern neurons. And they are, once they're activated, they're going to summate their uh, action potentials uh, are going to summate both spatially and temporally 
on these motor neurons, okay? It means that those action potentials or the signals they send are going to summate a, 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 on the same area uh, of these motor neurons and at the same time, okay? And that temporal and a spatial summation would cause these motor neurons to, uh, you know, would cause, uh, they actually cause a very large EPSP in those motor neurons. And so they release a lot of synaptic vesicles, and as a result of that, the gill is, is, you can see a very intense gill withdrawal as a result of that, okay? This dashed line represents the original size of the gill, and you can see that the gill withdrawal is, is relatively very vigorously and intensely as a result of that temporal and spatial summation on modern neurons, and a very large EPSP in modern neurons, okay? What happens in a habituated animal? Uh, well, when we repeat that tactile stimulus, that uh, mild and gentle stimulus, what happens is that you can see that the number of synaptic vesicles released by these uh, sensory neurons is decreased, okay? So as a result of that, we're gonna have a much smaller EPSP uh, in these uh, motor neurons and so as a result of that, again, we have a very mild uh, gill withdrawal. We don't see that intense gill withdrawal anymore. So what happens at the physiological level, or you know, if you consider the electrophysiology here, you can see that there's no difference okay, between the first action potential and the third action potential uh, in the sensory neuron. So the sensory neuron is not basically habituated. What happens is that, you know, it's just, uh, it's just going to release less synaptic vesicles. As a result of that, look at the EPSP in modern neurons. Okay, so we are recording these action potentials in sensory neurons. We are recording these EPSPs, excitatory postsynaptic potentials in modern neurons. You can see that in the very first stimulus, we have a relatively large EPSP in these modern neurons, but as we continue, there is going to be a gradual decrease in the, uh, in these, in, in, in the um, intensity of EPSPs. And you can see in the, very, uh, in the third stimulus, stimulus um, we have re a relatively a smaller EPSP in those modern neurons. And you can see the gill withdrawal. In the, very first, in the very first stimulus, we have a very large gill withdrawal. And in the last one, we have a very small one, okay? One hour after we do habituation, because it is short-term habituation, one after, uh, after the, uh, the organism rests, uh, the EPSP uh, is, is almost uh, recovered. You can see that we again have uh, a very large uh, uh, gill withdrawal, okay? And so the gill withdrawal is recovered because it is short-term habituation. So what happens in short-term habituation is that if you, know, if you want to induce short-term habituation, what we do is that we, ha we, 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 we do one session of stimulation. Each session has 10 stimuli in it. So one session, 10 stimuli, so that would cause or induce short-term habituation that may last up to hours. Okay, but if we do uh, four sessions of, of stimulation, so each session 10 stimuli, four sessions 40 stimuli, um, but four sessions separated by um, time intervals of, of hours or days, we're going to get uh, long term habituation. And long term habituation is going to last up to three weeks. Okay, and so let's consider um, the, uh, the case of long-term habituation as well. So this is, this is a depression of synaptic potentials by long-term habituation. What happens, you can see that the control, this is the action potential in the sensory neuron, okay, the, in the control. This is the EPSP recorded in the motor neuron. We have a very healthy large EPSP. In the long-term habituated animal, after one week, 
what you have is that, you know, um, although you may say that, you know, the, um, the action potential in the sensory neurons is, is in the control organism is a little bit broadened or broader and wider than, than this one, but, uh, you know, uh, they're almost the same. But look at the EPSP in the mono neuron. It's almost flat. So as a result of long-term habituation, we have almost no EPSP in the motor neurons, okay? But as I explained in, in um, biosignaling 1.2, short-term changes are all about functional changes, changes in uh, proteins and biomolecules inside the cell. Long-term changes, you know, in long-term changes, we are, also, we are going to have some structural changes as well. So, in long-term habituation, we are going to have some structural changes. And this graph shows the mean percentage of uh, detectable synaptic connections between sensory neurons and motor neurons. And it turned out then in the healthier, uh, in a control organism, when it, uh, the, in, in an aplasia that is not habituated, or not, uh, that uh, we didn't induce long-term habituation, 90% of those sensory neurons makes detectable synaptic connections with those motor neurons, okay, 90%. But if we induce a long-term habituation, what happens is that that percentage is going to be is going to be decre uh, decreased by 30 percent. So in a long-term habituated uh, organism, only 30 percent of modern of sensory neurons make detectable synaptic connections with with those modern neurons. Okay, and that's a that's a huge uh, that's a very uh, uh, intense uh, structural change actually. So this is a control one. You can see that almost 90% of those sensory neurons make synaptic connections with those modern neurons. But if when we, intru when we induce long-term habituation, after one day, that number decreases to almost uh, around 30%. And that persists for one week. And what's um, interesting here is that even after three weeks, we still don't see full recovery to 90%. Even after three weeks, uh, it's around 60%. So that is uh, uh, very, in that shows us a very intense structural change as a result of long-term habituation in a pleasure. So, uh, okay, that was that, fine. So that was the very first section. Um, <clears throat> I talked about habituation. I defined habituation. Um, I talked about aplasia and uh, a very uh, that extreme uh, approach that Dr. Kendall took to uh, address habituation and sensitization. He talked about aplasia. I talked about uh, the habituation um, in a pleasure. So, next I'm going to talk about sensitization in a pleasure. Okay, so uh, let's go for it. <laughs>